morning, everyone, and welcome. And uh, hello to everyone who is might be watching on uh, YouTube. Hello. And uh, I've been away for a month or so. It's nice to be back here with all of you here. And um, <clears throat> I was away doing a month-long retreat, and and I was really on my own in a cabin up in the Sierras. But I had one uh, discourse of the Buddha that went through my mind that I reviewed and was kind of inspiration for it. And so I'd like to share that with you today. And um, there was a core teaching of the Buddha that is, uh, that's uh, given in the discourse. It's not by the Buddha. It's, uh, he gave it, but then someone a disciple of his repeats it in the context of the story. And, uh, and the story is interesting when the teaching is particularly uh, powerful. And uh, it's said to be uh, the teachings from the Buddha that was kind of the genesis of what of Zen, of Mahayana Buddhism, of this famous philosopher Nagarjuna. So it's a very, 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 very significant teaching. But the fact that it's in this wider context of the story is nice. And the story has to do with a monk named Chana. And Chana had been a monk for, it could be 45 years. And, uh, and he was distraught for a number of reasons. But one of them, after 45 years of being a monk in the time of the Buddha, he still wasn't enlightened. He still didn't, uh, in his language, he knew the teachings, but he had not seen the teachings. And uh, just learning the teaching is one thing, but to see, that, see it for yourself in your direct experience, that's a whole other thing. But not only had he not uh, seen the teaching, discovered and experienced it for himself, um, he apparently was a bit of a troubled man. Uh, so many of you have heard of him in, without his name. If you've uh, heard the story of the Buddha, how he left the palace as a, as a prince, and he went with his charioteer out into the streets. He was, he was given a kind of a protected life. And somehow he was able to leave the palace compound. And his charioteer took him out into the streets. And there he encountered what's called the four heavenly messengers. He saw someone who was sick, someone who was old, someone who had died. And then he saw a monastic uh, renunciant. And he'd never seen those before. So it's kind of unusual in the world to have people um, not see sickness, old age, and death. Though many people in the modern world, in the United States, don't see it very readily, especially death and things are put away. Coincidentally, uh, the first time I ever saw a dead body in my life was when I was 11 years old in Nepal, which is where the Buddha went out. I was out in the streets and there was this uh, young child wrapped in blanket being carried to the river to be burned. And so uh, the Buddha was uh, 29, supposedly. And so the charioteer, his name was Chana. This is the man who became a monk. And the story is that he was um, born around the same time as the Buddha, born of a servant, maybe a servant in the palace. And so probably Chana and the Buddha grew up together. Probably they were friends. They'd known each other for... And, um, and then uh, to make it more kind of powerful, this connection between the Buddha and Chana, um, when the Buddha then eventually escaped the palace and went to renounce his royalty and go off into, down from the area of foothills of the Himalayas down into the plains of, uh, where he did his spiritual seeking as a renunciant, um, Chana took him on the first leg of that journey, took him out to the edges of the kingdom, I guess. And then uh, the Buddha said, okay, let, you can leave me here. And he took off his royal garments, his jewels, and he handed Chana, I don't need this anymore, they're yours. And, um, and then he, Chana was supposed to go back to, with them all. And so that was a momentous role for Chana, and it said it was very meritorious to be the one who supported the Buddha to do his renunciation. 
So after the Buddha was enlightened, he came back to his hometown, and uh, Chana then uh, ordained as a monk. And uh, and then, um, but it seemed like he was he had some problems. Maybe he was a troubled person. And it seemed that uh, for one thing, he was uh, he kept breaking the rule, monastic rules. And uh, he kind of would deny that he broke them. And, and then at some point, it was bad enough that the Buddha said, okay, you have to kind of go live it by yourself for a while. You can't live with them together with other monastics for a while. So, and um, so what he did was he just went to found an other monastic community to live in. I mean, another Buddhist community, another town. And that was kind of like, that, that wasn't... That was breaking the rules, so the Buddha called him back, and they had a, they worked something out, and um, but he was kind of known to be obstinate, stubborn, and um, and maybe other ways. Also, he there was an arrogance, a conceit that he had, because of this special connection he had to the Buddha. Does it need to be louder? Is it okay, the volume? Okay, so. Um, so this conceit, you know, that he had a special connection to the Buddha kind of interfered maybe with his engaging in the practice. So uh, apparently his behavior as a monastic became bad enough that uh, one of the last kind of declarations the Buddha made before he died, like the last note, the last thing, one of the, one of the last things he had to say was something like, and by the way, the monk Chana uh, he is going to have the, the Brahma Danda, the Brahma punishment, which is one of, considered to be one of the highest kind of punishments or something that you can get as a monastic. And, um, and that is that uh, no monastic in the order was supposed to talk to him anymore. So he, he, wasn't, he wasn't disrobed, it's just like, you know, you, no one should talk to him. And that's pretty bad, you know, kind of may make you isolated. So he must have done something pretty bad, but not bad enough to be disrobed. And um, so that was one of the last things, that's a significant thing the Buddha to say. So, so the Buddha died. And then Ananda, the Buddha's attendant, who was also kind of from the same town, they known each other for also for a long time. It was his job to go tell Chana about this order, this, what happened. That seemed to have upset Chana quite a bit. It seemed to have a wake-up wake call for him. And he decided, well, I better get serious here about my practice. I better do something here. And maybe that's what the Buddha knew. The Buddha knew that Chana needed some real poking to really get him to get serious after 45 years of being a monk and not really doing the practice. And, um, and so, in fact, that's what he did. He got serious. And so the, the, the sutta, called the Chana Sutta, begins with Chana going around to the elder monks of the time, going, I guess, early in the morning and maybe waking them up. And, um, and he says to them, may the elders instruct me, may the elders teach me, may the elders provide me with a Dhamma talk so I can see the Dhamma. So he really is ready, he wants to see it, he doesn't want to just know it. However, there's this rule, Dhamma, uh, Brahma Danda, that he's not supposed to be talked to. So the elder monks kind of dismiss him. But they do give him a little teaching, but they give him this, the most rote kind of simplistic or the most rote kind of formulaic teaching, the Buddha, the core Buddhist teaching of the time, that they could, they kind of like, like you almost feel like they're like just yelling at him, like, and they're saying, some of you know the teachings of the five aggregates. Uh, usually it's called uh, form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. I prefer to translate it as appearances, feelings, recognition, constructs, mental constructs, and, um, and cognitions. And they tell, so they tell uh, Chana, these elders, say, um, appearances are impermanent, inconstant, appearances are, feelings are inconstant, recognitions are inconstant, uh, constructs, mental constructs are inconstant, and cognitions we have are inconstant. And, and then they close the door. <laughs> or they, they actually, sometimes they say, and all those things are not self. 
So appearances are not self, feelings are not self, recognitions are not self, mental constructs are not self, and cognitions are not self. And they close the door. And, uh, and so Chana then says, wait a minute. <laughs> He's just going to distraught. He, says, and he speaks to himself. And he, uh, um, and he thought, um, um, I know all this. <laughs> I know all this. But my, um, but my mind is not leaping in inspiration by this teaching. Uh, it doesn't become, my mind doesn't become confident, settled, resolved uh, about the quieting of all my mental constructs, all my mental kind of shenanigans in my mind, my chatter and all that. I'm not, that doesn't, I'm not confident about the value of doing that, of quieting the mind and constructs, of giving up all my attachments, of, of uh, ending my craving of Nibbana, of freedom, liberation. So he hears the teaching, so not only doesn't, he doesn't see it for himself, but it doesn't inspire him. He doesn't understand it well enough to, that this is great, this is a great thing. And it is hard to understand how these teachings on the five aggregates is a wonderful teaching, but maybe I'll try a little bit to get us, give you a feeling, because it will prepare you for what's going to come. So they say that appearances are inconstant, impermanent. So appearances, what this means is anything that appears at any of the five sense doors. So sights, <clears throat> sight objects appear. Sound objects, sounds appear and we hear them. Smells appear and we smell them. Tastes appear and we taste them. And tactile experiences appear. And so these are called appearances. And these are inconstant. They're constantly shifting and changing and flowing and, and, uh, and becoming different things. You go through the day and there's a whole series of different physical sensations you'll experience throughout the day. Uh, um, it's already, you know, it's a little after 10 and I'm already hot. Probably we should turn the air conditioner on. <laughs> and then we'll have a different sensations in our body. And, uh, but this morning it was kind of cool and nice, all kinds of things. So it's, it's all shifting and changing. And so now what's appeared for us, for some of us, I guess, is it's warm. That's what's appeared. But we know that it's not going to stay warm. It's going to be warm for a few hours. <laughs> but so, so sooner or later it'll get cool and things will shift and change. And we know this is inconstant. And for some things that we hear that they're inconstant, you see, okay, we'll put up for this for now. We'll, we'll work with this now. It's not going to make a, de- make a big deal. I'm not going to get attached to it being, having to be this way or attached to it needing to be different because it's all shifting and changing. And that sense of shifting and changing ca- can loosen up the grip we have on how things are at any given moment. This becomes more important when it has to do with our feelings. And feelings here, is, uh, in the Buddhist context, means uh, that uh, the experience of pleasantness and unpleasantness. And that also is shifting and changing throughout the day and the hour and the minute, depending on what, where the, ma- the mind lands on. Uh, some now, unfortunately, I brought up the fact that it's warm in here. So maybe some of you have been reminded about how unpleasant that is, or maybe some of you find it very pleasant and very satisfying. But if I hadn't said it, you probably would have been so gripped by my teaching that you wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> and, um, and so, and so, uh, uh, so you can be reminded by things, or then you can be, I can tell some uh, t- tantalizing story, more tantalizing than Chana story, and you'll be the ed- edge of your seat and you won't notice anymore. Your body's uncomfortable, it's unpleasant, or you won't notice how pleasant certain things are. These all, these, these, uh, these all appear, they come and go, they change and shift. And there's something very significant about tuning in to how the flow the stream of sensations come and go and shift and change all the time, that somehow or other is quite freeing if we see it and live in it. We partly don't live in it because we live in our constructs. We often live in the stories we tell ourselves and the interpretations or the recognitions, the third of these five aggregates. And recognitions have to do with uh, 
how we identify or see something that is innocent enough. You see a door and you recognize it as a door. That seems no problem. But uh, we recognize things that are often a problem. Um, you know, racism is a recognition, right? You recognize people in a certain way um, and, uh, or internalize racism. You recognize yourself in a certain way or uh, all kinds of other ways in which we recognize other people or recognize ourselves. And when we see other people in the street, what are we, re what are we seeing? What are we reacting to? What are we identifying? What are we taking as being the important thing to notice? If someone is, uh, looks big and threatening and dangerous, that's the recognition, danger. If someone is really attractive, then the recognition is, ah, this is interesting. Maybe I shouldn't look or something. But we have all these, we recognize things. But when we can see that the recognitions that we have are contingent, the recognitions are partly a product of our own mind, and they also come and go. And we can see them come, oh, there's one. So, you know, I've gone down the street and recognized someone as being, that's a dangerous person, and maybe. And, and then I say, oh, I could watch my mind have that thought. And because I can see it being born, uh, is that really so? I didn't have that thought before. That thought came out of my mind. It's a mind, mind creation construct. It might not be true. But if I don't have the mindfulness to see the birth of the thought, then the person and the danger are not distinct. I kind of meld those together. And my projection of danger on that person is, um, is who the person is in my eyes. So to be able to see the arising and then the disappearing of these recognitions we have is very freeing and very wise because then you can give that person on the street a second look. Is this really the case? Oh no. It just, the person just looks like my third grade bully. And that's all. <laughs> Actually, the person looks quite sweet. And, uh, and so then kind of the, the recognition, the bubble pops of that recognition perhaps. Or maybe the person is dangerous. I used to live in a dangerous neighborhood. All my roommates got robbed at gunpoint or knife point, except for me. And, um, and uh, there were people in the neighborhood, you know, I think I'll cross the street. And then they'd follow me. And then I went into a store, you know, to kind of be safe or something. So, so there's dangers out there, but, uh, but you know, just to be able to see the recognition, you know, we really seeing accurately. And then these stories, the constructs we make, uh, is kind of related to what I just said, to see how they come and go and see, see how they're born gives us a sense that they're not solid, they're not fixed. Oh, there's, I made a story up. And then cognitions are all kind of in the same regard. We, 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 the difference between cognition and recognition is not that great in the teachings. But cognitions are more basic than recognitions. Recognition is a recognition of something you already know from before. So this is, this is what the emphasis, but to say this in a simplistic way over and over again, as the Buddhist teachings do, um, makes the mind numb. And, uh, and probably that's what happened to Chana. He, you know, and so they said to him, you know, this is the, all these are impermanent, all these are not self. These are just things that are occurring, not self. That you, don't, you don't make a self out of them. So again, the heat that's happening here, is that who you are? Are you the sensations of heat at the moment? Are you the heat? No. You, are you the unpleasantness of the heat? You, if you make yourself like, I am that unpleasantness, then who are you when it gets cool? Do you shift and change your identity based on what you're feeling all the time? Are you, is your identity fixated by your, what you recognize or is something deeper? And so many of the recognitions we have um, about ourselves are contingent, are tentative, are not so accurate even sometimes, but we can live kind of glued onto them and have a lot of suffering. So to see these five different areas as being impermanent and not self 
to see it is one of the things that the early Buddhist tradition said was freeing. So uh, Chana uh, had enough of this from these guys. <laughs> and so he was distraught and he said, I'm not inspired by any of this. And, uh, and he said, um, um, instead, what arises in me, my mind doesn't leap in inspiration, rather what grows is my anxiety and my clinging. So he's just an anxious guy, you know, just the more he looks at this and feels it, the more anxious he gets, the more he clings and holds on. So poor guy. He says, my mind is spinning. Poor guy, you know. He's, he's really troubled, he's spinning, he's, you know, and then his companions in the spiritual life, his fellow monks, are not really, take, you know, talking to him anymore. So what is he going to do? And then he says, for someone who sees, he's thinking to himself, for someone who sees the teachings, it does not occur to ask, who then is myself? Who's the self? What is the self? Someone who sees doesn't ask that question, which is a common question. It's considered one of the great spiritual questions or existential questions. Who am I? But for the Buddhists, there's something about if you really see this life directly in a clear way, you wouldn't ask that question. Why is that? Um, so he says, so, um, so that I can see the teaching, who is it who can point the teachings out to me? Who can make it clear? And then he remembers Ananda. The Buddha is one of the primary attendants and fellow person from the same town. They grew up in the same town also. And he says, um, uh, Ananda was praised by the Buddha and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. Venerable Ananda can point out the Dhamma so I can see the, Dhamma, the teaching. I have a lot of love for Venerable Ananda. Why don't I visit him? It's uh, kind of very touching. This guy's so troubled, and he says, well, I have a lot of love for this man. And, um, and so he's going to go see. And um, so he goes to Ananda, and, um, and he tells him the story of what happened with uh, the, these elder monks and, and the whole story that led up to why he came. And uh, then he says to, say, he says, May Venerable Ananda instruct me. May Venerable Ananda teach me. May Venerable Ananda provide me with a Dhamma talk so I can see the teaching. And uh, in reply, Ananda said, on this matter, I am certainly delighted with Venerable Chana that you have opened up and cut through your obstinacy. <laughs> so, you know, he, apparently he wasn't available for the teachings for 45 years. And he was obstinate, right? So that's quite something to come to the teaching. Probably was around it and around and around it, but wouldn't really take it in, wouldn't open himself up to really listen and take it in. And, but now finally, after the, all this, he was willing to. And so, so Ananda says, I'm delighted that you've opened up and cut through your obstinacy. Listen, Venerable, give ear, Jana. You can understand the Dhamma. You can understand the teachings. And then uh, Jana thought to himself, very excitedly, oh, it seems I am capable of understanding the Dhamma. <laughs> if Ananda says so, it must be true. <laughs> and so, um, a great rapture and delight sprung up in Venerable Jhana. So here's something very significant. To have someone else believe in you. To have someone else think, you can do this. You can understand. Someone, and some people grow up without having anyone who believes in them in that way, in any way, in all kinds of ways. And so, you know, there's a real barrier to do, to learn, to open up, to go out, even go out into the world if you haven't been believed in and supported and, 
and shown that you're capable and loved and cared for and all kinds of things that go on. And maybe Chana, maybe, you know, he was a son of a servants. And maybe there's something about that life of poverty and servitude that didn't really support him to have that kind of confidence or maybe it kind of, maybe it was a difficult life and maybe something shut down or was discouraged or who knows what happened to him. Who knows why he was so difficult for all his lives. Maybe he had a very difficult time growing up and and so to someone to, like Ananda say, you can, that, that really went deep. He had, he had rapture and delight. So, um, so then uh, Ananda says, okay. So then he starts giving him the teaching. And he says, I heard this in the very presence of the Buddha. Because he was his attendant, he was there. And this is the teachings to a different monk named um, uh, Gochana, Gochana Gota. And, um, and he uh, asked the Buddha, what is right view? What is right view? What's the right way of seeing or the right understanding to have to engage in the Dhamma? Uh, generally, uh, more technically, right view in Buddhism is the way we see the world when we have the first glimpse of enlightenment. So it's not just what you learn, you know, from a book, but when you have some kind of your dharma eye, your enlightened eye opens, now you see in a new, new way. So when you ask, when this monk asks, what is the right view? He's asking more than just what's the, you know, some piece of teaching. He's asking, what is it? What is, what's the vision that we have of the world when, we, when we're enlightened? And um, so the, uh, and, and this, and so the, uh, the Buddha was said that, that it said, Ananda is repeating what the Buddha said to Kachana. This world relies on the, on the dyad of existence and non-existence. That things exist or they don't exist. But when one sees with right wisdom the arising of the world as it comes to be, the thought of non-existence doesn't occur. When one sees with right wisdom the cessation of the world, it doesn't occur that something exists. So the idea that things exist, and in particular the thing that exists that's a big problem, is you. <laughs> of course, you know, I want to say of course you exist, but in the Buddhist worldview, um, you don't exist as a fixed thing. There's no essential, fixed, solid, core thing that you are. Uh, and, and also you don't not exist. And so this is an enigmatic, it's quandary, people struggle with this kind of teaching. How does this mean? I don't exist and I don't not exist. I mean, these Buddhists are crazy. And, um, and giving these kinds of kind of statements. And, um, but then the Buddha says that um, if you can see that a thought arises, and I'm just paraphrasing, a thought arises in your mind, that person is dangerous, you see that it was just born in that moment. It didn't have an existence before, it's temporary, it's just there. It, can't, it, it doesn't exist in some permanent solid way, it's there as a visitor. And, um, but it's there. You can't say it doesn't exist. But because you see that it's, you see it pass away after a while, that you no longer have that thought, then you see that a just, person just looks like your third grade bully, and so immediately you feel, okay, the person, you see, oh, the person's sweet, actually. Then uh, you see it go, you say, well, that, now I see it went away. And um, so uh, because it's gone away, it, it, was, it, it didn't solidly exist as something. So it, 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 you don't say it exists, you don't say it doesn't exist. What you say is that it's in process. It's, it's in constant. It comes and goes. It's part of the flow and shifting, changing stream of living experience that we live in. And the idea is to, in Buddhism is to learn how to float, swim in the stream of constantly shifting and changing world that we live in swimming in a, in a stream, in a river, 
as opposed to, if I'm allowed to stretch this metaphor, um, uh, getting stuck in the river in the winter time when it gets frozen over and you're frozen in and you can't get out. And so often we get frozen around our ideas, frozen around our concepts and feelings and emotions about holding on to them and clinging to them and get fixated. And so to see the comings and going, oh, they are just appearing now for a while. They just, it was born. It just came into being. And now it's gone. And there's something about seeing that and knowing that we begin to relax our grip. Something begins to thaw and melt that has been frozen for a long time or fixated for a long time. And um, so, so when the Buddha says the uh, rising of the world, he means the world of our experience. It's very clear in the teachings. He doesn't mean, you know, the external world. Uh, it's the world of our experience. It comes and goes. Um, so, um, so that's nice, maybe. I don't know what you think of that. The next teaching is what uh, was uh, very significant for me in my month-long retreat that I kind of supported me as I went through. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase it to make it real, so it's real simple and maybe understandable. There's a lot of synonyms, you know, with, you know, there's a lot of words, extra words maybe to make it really clear, but I think it detracts also. Um, this world, mostly this world, the Buddha says, mostly this world, world of people, uh, is attached. That's, most people are attached. Um, but in relationship to these attachments, um, if one does not cling to the attachments, if one does not cling to them um, uh, with the idea, this is who I am. So it's one thing to be attached. It's the other, th the other thing to put on top of that a second attachment where I'm identifying myself, I am that attachment. So I might really like ice cream, a hot day, Seems nice, attached to ice cream. That's maybe, you know, ordinary enough. But then, you know, I get attached to, I am the ice cream eater. <laughs> I am the ice cream liker. And I better let everyone else know that this is who I am. And I'm gonna prove that I'm a really good ice cream liker by buying sophisticated ice cream flavors and, uh, and really show that I'm really kind of like a special ice cream eater, not just an ordinary ice cream eater. And I'm gonna get a little label on my shirt that you know, says you know, champion ice cream eater or something. And, um, and then it becomes important not just to go to, you know, I don't know, the ordinary ice cream shop, but you have to go to the artesian ice cream shop <laughs> to get, you know, the most sophisticated ice cream because, you know, that, that says something about who you are as a sophisticated person. So it's one thing to really like ice cream and want it and maybe even crave it, but the layer of selfing that can go on top of it can be quite strong. So, so that's a silly example. I'm hoping that you can understand, maybe apply it and see that maybe something like this plays itself out in your life also that uh, how much we identify. And one identification to clinging, especially among Buddhists, is because in Buddhism we're trying not to cling, and we see that we're clinging, and now we say, uh -uh, I'm a bad Buddhist. And now we've added the second layer of clinging, clinging to a kind of self. We've identified, I am a bad Buddhist. You know, it's bad enough to cling to ice cream but to then be a bad Buddhist because, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, that's adding these layers, right? So, so that's what the teachings, so the teachings are, um, um, so, and then it goes, oh, so the world clings, the world gets attached, and to those attachments, uh, someone who has a right view does not cling 
to the idea this is who I am. Um, one, and then one will have no doubt that that very dukkha, that very suffering of the attachment is just the arising, the appearing of suffering. One will have no doubt that when it disappears, it's just a disappearing of it. So there's something about the attachment of self that we have, the clinging to self and then applying it to all our different things, that obscures the nature of the, un, of the first layer of attachment. There's something about me, myself, and mine that we overlay on top of it that freezes it, fixates it, obscures it. But if we don't identify with our clinging, don't identify with our attachments, and don't say it, I'm attached, we say there is attachment here, then there's a better chance to see that what all it is, it's, it's suffering. It's suffering is occurring. So if I get really, if, you know, maybe some of you now too, I'm sorry if I caused this for you. Um, you know, now so you have a, mostly what you're thinking about now is ice cream. <laughs> and you're like, as soon as this is over, Gil, Gil wants to stop talking because I need to get out to this ice cream store quickly. You know, and you're attached to your ice cream. But then if you, um, if you pay, if you're not kind of distracted by, I'm because I need to go to ice cream. I'm the great ice cream eater, and I need to prove it to everyone. But just staying close to the primary attachment, then there's an opportunity to see that that's suffering, that hurts. Ouch! There's a clinging, a contraction, a hurt, a stress. Any attachment we have involves stress. Anything that we, anytime we clamp down, clings. Um, you know, is stressful. But to see the stress, the, what the Buddhists call suffering, dukkha, as just an, to see it arise, to see it appear, to have the ability to be mindful, there it is, it just appeared, gives you the opportunity to stay in the stream and not to freeze. Oh, it's just suffering. That's what it is. And there, now I've gotten distracted. You know, I could probably distract you. If you, some of you are suffering now by how long this Dharma talk has been. <laughs> I can probably distract you for a moment if I talk a little bit about, say, something like, you know, that uh, it's, it's possible that spiders will fall from the ceiling. Here. <laughs> so for a moment, probably, you forgot everything else but the spiders. <laughs> and um, so the... Um, Anyway, so, uh, um, uh, so then the Buddha goes on. And so then he says, the Buddha goes on to say, if you see this clearly, then um, you will become independent in the teaching, in the, in the Buddhist teaching. You, you won't depend on anybody else, or any book or anything, because you don't have to, it's not learned, the teaching. Now you see it which is the goal that China had. He wanted to see. And so Ananda uh, is pointing, saying, you see it by seeing how you get attached to self around your experiences you have. And sometimes it's a negative attachment, sometimes it's a positive attachment, sometimes it's just a confused attachment. But we often, this whole selfing thing is a big source of suffering. And the attachment to self is considered maybe the primary core suffering of it all because it obscures all the other clingings. We can't see it as part of the stream and the flow and the shifting and changing. So we can kind of float along without freezing around it, getting caught in it. So the idea, so that's all it takes. You don't have to get a PhD in Buddhist studies to understand the Dharma. You can just kind of see, this is how you see it is to see how things, when they appear, when you're right there, mindfulness right there, oh, there it is, there it is, it appears. Oh, and there it went. It makes the mind, the heart, more fluid, more at ease, more open, more kind of willing to kind of go, be carried along in the stream of life as it flows and moves through us. And the Buddha goes on and says, um, as quoted by Ananda, 
everything exists is one extreme. Everything does not exist is the second extreme. Avoiding the two extremes, the Tathagata, the Buddha, teaches the Dharma through the middle. And the middle is that things arise and they pass. That's the alternative. That's the way you find your way into the middle of the stream where it's not frozen, where everything flows. So, uh, so I sat in my retreat and was reminded of these teachings regularly. And right there, awareness arising. Right there. And don't, don't make this self. Don't make this into me, myself, and mine. Let it be. Let it be. Let it just flow. Let it come and go. Feel the suffering of it come. Feel the suffering of it go. There's something very, when we see, when we feel and see how the arisings and passing are suffering, it makes it a lot easier and simpler to want to let go of it. We're sophisticated people sometimes, so if we have sophisticated clingings like the ice cream, then um, it's hard to kind of, you know, give it up. But if we just see, oh, that's clinging to ice cream, that's suffering, that's stress to have it. It makes it a lot simpler and easier. Okay, let go, let go. And um, so, let's see. So, uh, So then uh, Chana, this is a story about Chana in the end. So the sutta ends with Chana telling Ananda, Reverend Ananda, this is how it is to have care, to be cared for. Isn't that nice? I mean, here, this is why. Maybe even if he had been a monk all these decades, maybe he was not open, he was not available to feel how the people care for him. This is how it is to have care, well-wishing, instruction and teaching uh, by the venerables who are companions in the holy life. So his companions, right? That's, you know, the people is Having heard this Dhamma, this teaching, the teaching now has been fully settled. A nice ending, nice story. So I thought there's a there's a humanity to this story about this man who was troubled and and what it took to be somehow open to hear the teachings and and then as he heard these teachings to feel cared for and loved in a certain way perhaps and and uh, and then to be and then to understand now it's settled now he knows. So whether you understand that core teachings that is said to be the origin of much of Mahayana Buddhism, Zen even, um, uh, maybe at least you uh, were uh, struck by the humanity of care and love and believing in each other. And, and maybe that's the way to be open, be available to hear these teachings. And maybe someday, too, we'll have the teaching settled. So thank you very much. And um, may you all be well. Sometimes in during these last months, we've been meeting out in the parking lot afterwards if people would ask you know, questions or discussion. It's kind of hot out there probably. So I suggest we turn the air conditioner on and, and I'll just stay here for a while. Some of you want to stay and we can have a little discussion. And you know how to do the air conditioner?
So any questions anyone wants to ask? Maybe we can ask with the, the handheld mic so that, so that uh, people can hear. We'll take maybe 10 minutes for this. Gil, just wondering which... Uh, Is it on? <clears throat> doesn't sound like it. Testing. Uh, Gil, which sutta is that uh, about Chana? It's a, you call it Chana Sutta. Middle length and, and discourses. Chana, and it's known by its number. It's the uh, 22.90 in the connected discourses. So the 22nd chapter, it's the 90th sutta in that chapter. Connected? Connected? Connected discourses. 22.90. Yeah, here yeah, you can have it. Thank you. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> You can have it. I also posted it. Uh, my, this is my translation. I posted it on uh, IMC's website. Um, you know, there's a reflections from Gill under what's new. So I, I put it there in my reflections from me. So you can, if you want to read it again, it's there. Um, Thank you very much for that talk, Gail. Um, I'm really struck by the transition of awareness, emptiness, and then metta for Chana. It, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's almost as if he, w he had the talks, but he wasn't aware. And then this sense of not belonging somehow cut through that um, sense of maybe ignorance, delusion. Uh -huh. And then with the teachings on emptiness, it allowed the metta and the karuna to just flow freely. Mm. It's just, thank you, it was just told so beautifully. And part of the direction that flowed was into him. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, um, I just wanted to State a interesting quote I heard the other or read the other day. Alan Arkin, who recently died, the actor, he said, um, "Acting is not who I am. Acting is what I do," and that really stuck. It really drove home that point yeah. of the self of how we identify with the things that we, you know, our professions and beliefs and all that stuff. Nice, very nice. Thank you. Acting is not who I am, it's what I do. Including being a Buddhist. Hmm? Including being a Buddhist instead of just following yeah. the path. Yeah. Maybe no one should be a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> we just we should do Buddhism. <laughs> Yes, all the way in, in the back. So I just want to say the the belie believing in me that piece is really inspiring and resonating in the way that uh, sometimes for all the circumstances, the people you're close with may not believe in you of your pursuit. And uh, I just want to express the gratitude of mm. this Sangha in the way that uh, that's where I find a belief and a care. Mm, fantastic. And it's fantastic that you resonated with that. That's really meaningful that, uh, you, that you took that in. Thank you. Hey, Joe. So I was curious how Buddha missed that. How Buddha? He missed that, didn't he, with Chana? He, all those uh, 40 years? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, not, not, you can't expect everyone to 
get it right all the time. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty big order. We expect the Buddha to be perfect, but he was, he was human too. That's why we need a Sangha community, so that uh, we all have different kind of uh, capacities or connections, and so uh, he needed Ananda. And on that point, maybe Chana wasn't ready when the Buddha also was alive. Also, he wasn't ready. So he, he wasn't ready. He was, he was so closed and so obstinate that uh, he needed... And the medicine was that the Buddha finally, at the, at the end of his life, said, you're, you know, you, you know, no one's supposed to talk to you anymore. No monastic. You're not part of this community kind of... That's powerful medicine. And I hope the Buddha did that out of all his wisdom. He knew what was needed. And it seemed to, that seemed to have worked. That's part of the flow. That's and part, that, yeah, that that moment would have led to yeah. what eventually happened. Yep, sometimes very strong language, strong actions are needed. Hi, Gil. Good to have you back. I wonder if you feel like sharing more about how you worked with that teaching during your retreat, more like specific things you noticed or oh it was so, so simple so simple things like uh, if I was doing walking meditation and uh, I had this thought that uh, uh, oh I'm not getting concentrated enough enough I said oh that's a stressful thought that just arose it was just a thought that arose I don't have to believe it I don't have to identify with it or make myself into a bad walking meditator <laughs> Just oh look at that was just that was the rising of that, and then it was just like oh then it would poof it would just kind of dissolve. So there are a lot of lot of little things like that through the day, and it's like poof poof poof. I was um, also struck by the fact that. Uh, Ananda, despite the Buddha's instructions not to speak to Chana, that Ananda not only spoke to Chana, he, he really engaged with him fully. So I think that's interesting. I mean, that's profound, right, to me. Yeah. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about that as well. I don't know if there's best thoughts or something, but Ananda has this reputation of being a really friendly, really friendly monk. And he was um, much more friendly than some people thought he should be. So, for example, he was he was a big supporter of the nuns, and sometimes it was some people thought he was like too friendly to nuns, and so he was he had a very friendly disposition, and and um, and uh, that's what he was known for. So, the, the nice guy. And then, in terms of this, uh, this this rule that the Buddha said, to, you know, against Chana, Chana soon thereafter became fully enlightened. And when you're fully enlightened, all your those rules get dissolved; they go away. So then he was in good standing. Um, one thing when I was uh, hearing the story was that if I were to know Chana, I, I would feel very frustrated at his kind of uh, um, closed, uh, closed offness. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's any, anything else around maybe how the rest of the Sangha could, maybe if they did feel that frustration or maybe how they, they dealt with, with that. Yeah, probably that's why the, the elders, when they kind of just you know, th- kind of dismissed him with these simple teachings, it's all impermanent, go away. <laughs> um, it might have been not just the rule that the Buddha established that no one should talk to him, but it might be they've had decades of, you know, seeing how difficult he's been and and how he, he wouldn't listen or he wouldn't hear or it was pointless to try to have... Maybe people had tried for years to try to get through to him and so their frustration was there. And, and um, he might have been a very difficult person for others. And why he was difficult, we don't know. And... Um, Maybe he was, I don't know, maybe he was, uh, maybe we shouldn't even say he was difficult. Maybe he was just, uh, that nowadays we have the, the expression, uh, 
neurodivergent. They're different. Maybe he was. Maybe he was uh, had some kind of different brain than other people, and so he behaved differently. And I've known people who, who I was a little bit cautious around until I found out that that they had some kind of neurodivergence that was completely normal for some people to have. And oh, that's why they are the way they are. Okay. And then I was just completely happy with them. So who knows what the story? So so hard to reconstruct back there. But um, but it's such a common human phenomena for us to for people to be closed down to each other, shut down, not be available, be judgmental, and um, and uh, and then somehow to for love, care, respect to somehow dissolve that and opens things up. And I think that that's the kind of one of the powerful lessons I think of practice is uh, Ananda represents that as someone who understands the value, the power of love and care and friendliness, even for difficult people. I just wanted to uh, get some explanation on this issue of attachment is in terms of uh, the degree of attachment, is it strong, is, is it mild, is it uh, non-existent, and how it obscures the power of observation as we, you described, and power of awareness. Uh, is, there a, um, is there a way that you could act normally in regards to these things? For example, uh, obviously if you come to a, totally identify with who you are as a professional of some sort, or whatever doctor, engineer, whatever, or is it just a matter of, some, sometime a matter of simply the security that is required to live? And is that, a, is, that is that an attachment? And is that, if, if it is, does it obscure your power of observation? Right. So if I understand what you're saying, I can reply this way, that I think it's important not to think that attachment is a crime. Uh, you know, because, just because Buddhism is about the ending of attachment doesn't mean that it's necessarily wrong to be attached. It is stressful. It does, have atta- it does, it does hurt in some way. But uh, sometimes attachment's better than the alternative. You know, sometimes we like security and safety. Um, and... Um, you know, being being attached to a job because if you don't have a job, who's, how are you going to take care of your family or all, your old age or something? And so, you know, it's you know, you could give up the attachment, give up the job. The attachment keeps you motivated <laughs> to take do it well. If you don't attach, you might be lackadaisical and get fired or something, or just give it up, not show up for work, and then all these other things, repercussions are worse. So if, it, if, the, if the alternative to the attachment is worse, maybe it's good to keep the attachment for the time being. But uh, don't reify it. Don't make it into a belief or whole religion that you're supposed to be attached. Recognize, oh, this is attachment. The wisest, this is probably the wisest way I can do right now. I don't have to get rid of my, all my attachments right away just because I'm attached. Uh, let me keep practicing, and when the time is right, the practice is quite powerful. The pra- it's almost like the practice has its own wisdom. If you keep, to keep doing mindfulness practice and seeing, when the time is ready to address an attachment, it, you'll know. But in, you know, the fact that you know that you're attached doesn't mean you have to fix it right away. So, so when, the, when it's the best alternative, keep it. And I, I, I know Buddhist teachers say, even being attached to Buddhism, um, is sometimes better than the alternative, and and uh, you, know, you know, keep it as long as it's beneficial. Yeah. At some point, it's, it'll the benefits will not be there, and then you'll know it's self-correcting. Or if you become obsessed with it, if you get upset with it, obsessed with it, obsessed with it. Well, that's maybe, that's getting a little bit now <laughs> edgy, because then your family's not going to be happy. Thank you, your friends. Thank you so much for the story, Gal. I, you know, I've been replaying that story in my head again and again. A little bit louder. I. Is it loud now? Yeah. I really like the story, and I've been noticing in 
you know, very recently, like how unconditional love is answered to so many questions. And I really loved how Ananda was there and just giving Chahana unconditional love, irrespective of all the rules and everything. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful, thank you, nice to hear. So maybe we should stop, I'd like to stop. <laughs> and um, thank you all, very nice, nice to sit here with you and be.